All right. Well, good morning. Your mama says it's time to get started, so we're going to get started. Um, today, we're going to consider just one verse. Uh, it falls in order with the ones we ended up last time, but that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And I'm going to read that one verse, not only in the ESV, which is what we typically use, but in some other translations, um, because it's, it's, as we know, it's an extremely important verse. It's one of those that, uh, you know, it's one of those ones we need to, we ought to be committing to memory. Uh, we ought to meditate on it. We ought to certainly study it, because it is, it, it pretty much encompasses God's method of saving sinners, plain and simple. Um, so let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, first from the ESV. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. King James says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The NIV, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Berean literal Bible, I found this online. He made the one not having known sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then the New Living Translation. <laughs> for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. All right, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll consider this, this verse, okay? Father, again, as we, as we come to you to study your word, I, I pray that uh, today that, this, um, uh, that what I say today will be, will be clear, will be edifying, it will be something that will uh, make us... Um, consider your word even more deeply, and, and may I not certainly misspeak according to your word, but I pray that, uh, that, pray that what I say is, is true and that it will be um, beneficial to all that are here. We thank you for this time and your word uh, that tells us all about you in your son's name. Amen. And so, as I said earlier, this, this verse, we, we've all heard this verse, and it's one that, uh, you know, really should be one of those verses you commit to memory. It's one of those verses you meditate on it because of the, the depth and what it tells us about God and what he has done for sinful man. It pretty much just tells us this is how God reconciles sinful man to himself. This is the method by which he uses, for lack of a better term. Um, and it comes in the context of what we talked about last time and, um, from verses 16 to 21. He speaks that, that Christ's death, Christ died for all, and we, we spoke about the, all the believers, all those that would ever believe in him, that would eventually that believe in him, die to self, and live for Christ. All, and essentially, Christ died for all true believers. And then in verse 18, he says, all this is from God. And he's speaking about what we just said, that Christ died for, for all believers, but then actually what comes after it as well when he says, all this is from God, in verse 18, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And then in verse 19, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. So this is God. All this is from God. God is the, uh, that is the uh, author of this salvation. He's the designer of this plan of salvation. He's the one that, that puts it in motion. He's the one that applies it. He's the one that executes it. Um, but to consider it more fully, let's start at the beginning. Beginning, all right? B.C., and not before Christ, but before creation. That's what B.C. stands for now. Before creation, before the world was even created, God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existed, okay? Before any of us were ever here, um, but then in his good pleasure, he creates the world and, and humans. He creates Adam. 
Um, not because he needed any kind of company and he was lonely or anything like that, which you'll hear people say, but uh, just for his good pleasure because it, it, it pleased him. But then Adam sins and all posterity, everyone is in Adam, every human being then now has Adam's sin nature. And so that we are prone to sin, that's what we do. Um, uh, that makes us alienated from God because sin uh, is breaking God's law. Sin is, we're doing the exact same thing Adam did. He did something God told him not to do. And we do that every day, so, um, but that's in us. And so then sin is present ever since Adam has been there. But then God chooses a people out of this sinful humanity, not because they were any better than others or um, uh, anything like that. He chooses them again because of his good pleasure and places his favor on them through giving them the law, God's character, uh, the prophets come through him, the, the Messiah, to, to uh, show the world who God was. And he places his favor directly on them. And, but by giving them the law, Paul tells us that law even caused them to sin more because now we know what sin is. So sin has never stopped since Adam first sinned. I guess we can blame it on Eve, but Adam is the one that we're speaking of today. Um, but sin... But the law defines what sin is. Sin is lawlessness is what the Bible teaches us. The Bible also teaches us in James, if you break one, you've broken them all. It teaches that also um, uh, in other places as well. But we understand that, that once we break one of God's laws, we're, we've broken the law. We sin. The wages of sin is death, and that's what we deserve. Uh, in the Old Testament also, to the people of Israel, God gave this sacrifice, sacrificial system where he commands his favored people to make sacrifices, um, both for thanksgiving, such as uh, at harvest, for, for all the blessings that God has bestowed upon them, but also in remembrance of when they sin, they are to make sacrifices as well. And these, these sacrifices were never, uh, could never take away sins. It's told us in Hebrews 10:4 that, that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away our sins. So they didn't do that, but what did they do? Um, well, it was a, a, a constant reminder to the people of Israel really how sinful they were and the sin that was there. And that sin, they associate now sin with death, sin with death. We've, we've talked about that uh, before. We understand that sin, all sin deserves God's wrath and, and death. So we've got this problem uh, where we have a holy, perfect, righteous God, and we have a world of sinful mankind, and a world of sinful mankind. Even his chosen people were sinful mankind. We understand, and they they worshipped idols. They <clears throat> they went off the deep end more than once. Um, so even they, being his chosen people, are separated from God because of that sin, and they deserve his wrath. And God will punish. All sinners. All sinners will be punished in one of two ways, and uh, one will be in the lake of fire, the other will be through the blood of Jesus Christ. So, God, I hate to put, say this like that, but the Bible teaches us that in love, God predestined the people, um, chose a people, again, not like He chose Israel, that not any good in them, but He chose a people to redeem Himself, and He he wrote their names in this book, and that was all done before the foundation of the world. But how can God then bring them to himself but still punish them for their sin? Because we all deserve that punishment. So that's, that's an issue there, and that's something we as humans would probably figure out some kind of way to do that. As a matter of fact, God, um, God could he just... Uh, you know, could he just show his mercy, just kind of pass over that sin, kind of pretend like it didn't happen? Well, he couldn't do that. He is a merciful God. He is a gracious God. He is a loving God. But he's also a just God, a just God. And he, when he to reconcile sinner, he must uh, fulfill his justice as well. Um, 
and how he does it, he is the one that is just, and he is the one that justifies them also. Uh, so a sinner's only hope really is in a God that is a loving God that uh, will punish sin, but like we talked about, our, des- our only hope is not that he will punish us for our sin, but that we, he will punish us in his uh, wrath he took upon his son, Jesus Christ. So in this verse, um, God tells us the method, the way in which he does it. Because you can, you can just, as we've talked about earlier, that the, you know, Christ died for us. Well, okay, what does that mean? What, what, is, what did his death actually mean? What does his death actually accomplish? And so we, in this verse, I think we need to really understand a couple of things. And the first thing is that the reconciliation of sinful man to God is all by God. He's the author. He's the designer. He applies it. He executes it. He is the one who does it. And he doesn't just make it possible but he actually, he actually does it. He actually executes the plan, redeeming a people to himself. Because man, uh, and we talked about that in verse 18, he says, all this is through God who reconciled to himself. In Christ, he reconciled to himself. Um, and there can be no reconciliation between God and man unless God is the one who initiates it. We spoke of it last time, man's inability. Man does not have the ability nor the desire. Uh, he is not righteous. Um, man can, has, over the years, uh, made religions that, um, uh, that were works-based. In other words, they would figure out things to do that would make themselves righteous in hopes that it would be righteous enough to satisfy God. But the Bible tells us all those works are are filthy rags. Those are nothing that will make you right with God. And all religions apart from Christianity are that. They're filthy rags because they're all based on man trying to become righteous or good enough to earn favor with God. Uh, But Romans 3 is pretty clear about that none is good and none are righteous and no one seeks God. No, not one. If anyone, though, is going to figure out a way to become righteous with God, you would think it would be the Jewish people, his favored people. Because, look, I mean, they, they worship the Yahweh. They worship the one true God, right? And uh, God gave them the laws. God gave them the prophets. God promised the Messiah is going to come through them. Um, but they weren't saved. Uh, weren't saved. Paul makes that clear that it was his desire of his heart that the Jews be saved. Uh, if you look there in Romans 10, 1 through 4, Paul says this, Brothers, my heart desire and prayer to God is for them, speaking of his Jewish brothers, is that they may be saved. So he understood they weren't saved. And he, and he kind of tells us why they weren't saved, even though they knew God, they knew the true God, they had the law, they had all the advantages um, that they could possibly have on this earth. He says, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So that there are some things they did not understand. It says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God. So their idea of righteousness and the righteousness of God were two different things. Uh, The righteousness of God, as we know, is perfect. Perfect. Be perfect as I am perfect. No sin. Perfect righteousness. But they thought that by keeping the law, they could establish a righteousness of their own. That was their idea, and that is the idea of all religions other than Christianity. So what they did, they did not submit to God's righteousness uh, because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone. So the righteousness that they were seeking, they could not obtain, but they thought they could. Their righteousness, this was a righteousness of man, And we all have a certain amount of righteousness in us when we do good things and stuff like that. But that's not going to get it. The righteousness that God expects, the righteousness that God, that you need to be made right with God is God's righteousness. Perfect, holy, sinless. 
So the Jews couldn't obtain it. No could any other religion obtain it. Um, only God can supply that righteousness that you need uh, to be reconciled to him. And so Jesus died on the cross. He went to the cross um, uh, not because he was betrayed by an evil man, although he was, okay, he went to the cross not because the angry mob crawled for his crucifixion, but they did. And he went to the cross not because Pilate had his agenda for, uh, for him, but he did as well. But he went to the cross because it was God's purpose, God's design. Uh, that is why um, Jesus said, I came to do the will of my Father. Uh, that is why in, in John 18, I think I put it up there. No, I didn't. Uh, in John 18... He said, shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? Speaking of that cup of wrath that he knew he was going to experience for taking our sins upon himself that God would pour out on him. He said, shall I not do that? That is the purpose he came for. And in Acts 2, Peter tells the uh, Jews there at the day of Pentecost that, yeah, you killed the Son of God, but it was by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So, Sinful men crucified Christ, yes, but the, the whole, the whole uh, event was orchestrated and carried out by God. So if you're going to think of a way to reconcile yourself to God, if you're going to think of a way to, um, for God, say, to reconcile us, if you're going to think of a plan on how to do that, I'm not sure what you would think. You'd probably think something like most religions are. You just need to do good and, and uh, get as righteous as you can and hope God grades on the curve and you're a little bit past the thing in the bell curve. <laughs> but, but think about this plan that God, that God, that God has done. He, he sends his own son. And only God could, could ask Jesus to come to earth, to, to leave his place with God by his side, come to earth, uh, be obedient to death on a cross and die for sinners. Only God could do that. Only, and only God really knows what kind of atonement is necessary to appease himself. Okay? I mean, you know, we could think of ways that God couldn't have done it a little bit easier, a different way. But only God knew what would appease his wrath against sin. Uh, and only God knew what, that, what would appease his hatred to sin but still keep his justice intact um, without destroying the sinner. Um, and only God knew, only God knows what his righteous requirement is. And it's not any righteousness that we can obtain by ourselves. So God sends his son to die for us. And, and you can see how this would be a stumbling block to the Jews. You know, the Jews, they, they got to do they got to do everything they, they can to make themselves as righteous as they can. And so now you're telling me that I don't have to do all those things? That someone died and, and now they're giving me God's righteousness? So you can see how that would be a stumbling block. And you can see how to, to, the, uh, to the pagans and everyone else, well, that's just foolishness. Now, who would think of a plan like that? I mean, in, in, in my uh, depraved days, I couldn't figure that e either, and it seemed foolishness to me. But in God's wisdom, it's the perfect plan, and it's the only plan. There was no plan B, okay? This is plan A. Plan A was always going to take place, okay? And this whole plan flows, though, out of God's love. I mean, we, we don't want to... Uh, you know, picture God in anything that he is, and it all flows out of God's love for mankind, and, and his love is uh, shown there in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, in Romans 5, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now, that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Uh, in Ephesians 2, 4, these are all on your little hand out there. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. And then in Ephesians 1, that, that great verse 3 through 6, um, speaking of uh, the 
benefits that we get because of God's love. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now, there's only one way we can be holy and blameless before him, and that is for him, that is for, to, for us to have some kind of righteousness outside what kind of righteousness we can earn on our own. Um, and then in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. And again, it's according to the purpose of his will and to praise his glorious grace. Um, and it's not because of anything in us. So it's love is what, uh, what this, this reconciliation of us to God is flows out of his love. So, so the good news is truly this, is that we um, don't have, that we, we serve a, a loving God that supplies truly everything we need for salvation. Um, a loving God who sends a Savior, not a wrathful God that it we're trying to appease by all our good works. And that's truly the good news because now we don't have to consider uh, what we have to do to appease God. You know, we follow him out of our love for him, and we do good deeds because he made them beforehand that we should do them. Um, and you don't have to figure out a plan on how to, to get over that 50% good versus bad. You don't have to uh, work out your own righteousness. Um, God does it. He reconciles us to himself. The price has already been paid by his son. But what did it take to affect this plan? We spoke earlier that de sin and death are associated quite, uh, quite intimately, we'll put it that way. In Ezekiel, even in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 18.20, the soul who sins shall die. Okay, I think all of us have sinned. All of us shall die. That's what we should do. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. That is what we get. And in the Old Testament, they kept sacrificing. They sacrificed more and more to, um, uh, because God commanded them to do it as a constant reminder that every time they sinned and performed sins, that it was associated with death. Something had to die. And so the animals were really just symbols of, um, I guess, God's law being satisfied through them. But we understand from Hebrews, again, that that will never take away sin. The blood of an animal, bulls and goats, was never meant to take away sins. So God would have to send his own sacrifice, his own substitute for that. And it wasn't an animal. I guess it was an animal kind of, but it's man, okay? From a scientific standpoint, we're in the animal realm, right? Now, he had to send a man and his son, and he would be the final sacrifice um, for death or, or for sin through death. Uh, he came willingly. Uh, he came because God the Father uh, um, had him come and he obeyed him perfectly. So, so in our verse here today, uh, again, for our sake, and we'll skip that, he made him sin who knew no sin. He, God, made him Christ sin who knew no sin. So who, so who knew no sin? I mean, we, you know, we know, understand this speaks to Christ, but when we think of sacrificing, we know that no other man but Christ could fulfill that because the list is really short on men who have never sinned. Um, and, it's, and it's him. And, and, and on the other hand, also another, although this, this sacrifice would, would be a man, um, it couldn't be just any man because... All have sinned, okay? And because all have sinned, all the wages of that sin is death, and so we must be punished for our own sin, each and every one of us. Every man from Adam on must be punished for our own sin. So it couldn't be just any man being punished for your sin because every man is punished for his own sin, for his own sin. So it couldn't be just any man. It had to be a sinless man, um, who had no debt, who had that, that the wages of sin is, is death, who had no debt because of any sin that he committed. But it had to be a man 
uh, and Jesus was a man. He was a God man. He's born of Mary. Okay, but his his daddy was who? God, the Holy Spirit. It wasn't Joseph. Joseph was his earthly father that took care of him. But but he was he was man and he was God. He was the God man, and so he was the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice that could be made for sinful humanity. And the Old Testament pictures that as well. When, when the sacrifices were made, they were always a lamb without blemish, perfect. You know, they, in many of the Psalms, they're, they're criticized for putting sacrifices that were not perfect, but just kind of, you know, doing them because they had to do them. And so they'd give one of the, the worst lambs, someone that maybe was weakened or, or had an illness. But the Old Testament always commands a lamb perfect and as a, a, a lamb without blemish, spotless, uh, a perfect animal. And so this, again, pictures Christ, a man without blemish, spotless, sinless, a perfect man. The same idea there. And he, he knew no sin. He was the only one that knew no sin. He's the only one that never sinned. Now, I used to ask my question, myself this question when I'm thinking of these things. Well, how do we know he never sinned? <laughs> how do we know? Yes, we take it on faith, but the Bible certainly tells us that. But, you know, you see all these movies that, that portray, uh, and I can't remember which one it was, but supposedly they found offspring of Jesus genetically or something like that. Wasn't there a movie like that? Something like it. Well, there was. And so anyway, their idea is that Christ was a man, that he did sin. He had, I guess, an illicit affair with somebody, probably Mary, if that's, I think that's what they said. And so, that, so the idea of him being a sinless man, they're trying to refute that. But the Bible is clear that he was a sinless man. And so let's, and the Bible has, has several testimonies, and I think I listed them in here, as to, I think I did, yeah, Sinless, perfect, without guilt. Okay, what about non-believers in the Bible? You know, remember in John 8, 46, Jesus said to the Pharisees and the crowds that were, were uh, against him, which one of you convicts me of sin? And there's no answer. None of them had anything against him. What about Pilate, you know, cynical Pilate, uh, having his own agenda? You know, he said many times in Luke, uh, Luke 23, 4, then, I find no guilt in this man. And in 14, he says... I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges. And then in 20, verse 22, what evil has he, has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. And the thief on the cross uh, confessed as well. He, he said, said to Christ in his last moments, uh, you know, we indeed, and we indeed justly, we're suffering justly. He said this to the other, uh, the other thief that was there. Uh, for we're receiving due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And the centurion, when he saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, certainly this man was innocent. And those are all initially non-believers who would say that. But what about the believers? What about those that were the closest to him, such as Peter, John, his disciples? Um, Peter uh, testifies this in, in 119. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Again, there's that idea of perfection there. In verse 22, he committed no sin. That's pretty straight up, and neither was the seed found in his mouth. 24, this is why he bore our sins in his body, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Um, and, in, and in chapter 3, verse 18, for Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. So in order to be righteous, he had to be perfect, righteous in God's eyes. And then scripture goes on in Hebrews again, uh, 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Okay, 7.26, for it was indeed fitting that he should have such a high priest Holy is how he's described. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, without sin. He was the perfect sacrifice. So those closest to him um, would testify to his sinless nature. 
but God himself testified to it as well. As you recall in his, in his baptism, and I think I wrote these down there two times, in his baptism and then um, in his, um, uh, what am I talking about? He glorified, um, I said, no, I can't remember blanking on that. When, when he, uh, anyway, when God said, this is my son, I'm well pleased. Transfiguration. Transfiguration. I have trouble with words. But, in, but both those times, God said the same thing. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, how would God be pleased with his son unless he was perfect? You know, he didn't have any lower standard that he held it to. He was pleased because he was perfect. And Jesus repeatedly said many times through the scripture that I and the Father are one. We are the same nature. We are the same righteous natures. So Jesus knew no sin. He was unblemished. Um, he was blameless, perfect. He was a spotless lamb. But God made him sin. God made him sin because sin must be punished. So God makes him sin. So if God punishes a sinner, he will punish him to eternal destruction. But for all who are his, he provided the substitute. He provided his son. He made him sin who knew no sin. So what does that mean, he made him sin? Uh, I tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that Christ was a sinner. It doesn't mean that he somehow became a sinner uh, on the cross before he died. Uh, but the idea of what happened is, is there in Isaiah in the Old Testament. Uh, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Transgressions, iniquities, our sins. Um, we're all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sins of us all. So that's the idea is that Christ was not a sinner, but he was treated as if he was a sinner on the cross as if he was a sinner, not only as if he were a sinner, but as if he had committed every sin that everyone who would ever believe in him committed during their life. And that's called, that's got a word, it's called imputation. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it, which is what I probably do. Uh, the imputation, Christ never did sin, but our sins were imputed to him. He was treated as if we had done that. And once Christ, or once Christ, um, or once God imputed our sins to Christ, he poured out his wrath on them. He poured out the wrath against sin that sin deserves. And so you can see on the cross at some time why, why Christ would say, you know, why have you forsaken me? That would be something that maybe a sinner might say when God pours out his wrath on him. But, but Christ was treated as if he were a sinner, but he never did sin, and he was not a sinner. He was perfect, he was pure, he was sinless, he was holy, but he was officially guilty in God's eye. He officially took our sin and, observed, and obtained the punishment that we uh, deserved. So he, one of the terms they use for that is forensically guilty, uh, forensically guilty. So Christ became sin by this, this imputation. By uh, He was never evil, never sinned. But our sin was credited to him, and he was punished for it. I don't think I can say that too many times. But just as, his, just as our sin was imputed to Christ, Christ's righteousness was then imputed to us. And it's the same idea there. It's credited to us. It doesn't mean that um, yes, when we are saved, when we have that point in time where we become a new creation, as he talked about, and the old things pass away, the new has begun, we, everything about us changes, we desire to do more righteous things, but even in that state, we are not righteous with God in our own things that we do. So it still requires more than that. It requires the righteousness of Christ. So in order to stand before God, we cannot stand in any righteousness. Even all the good things we do after we 
um, are saved do not make us right with God. But what makes us right with God is the righteousness that Christ put into us on, the de on his death on the cross. He took our sins. He bore, um, I mean, he bore our sins. We get his righteousness. Not a very fair trade, but an awesome trade, I think you'd say. So, so you can look at this, and, and, and you know, the world would, would say, this is, this is folly, this is foolishness. Who would ever think of something like this? But we know it's God's wisdom. That is the way God saves sinners. Um, and he did it for our sake, uh, for our sake. Um, and, and for our sake, who's he talking? We get to understand who, our sake, who, who he did it for. And he, when he speaks in verse 21, for our sake he made him sin, he's speaking of everyone he had just spoken of in the verses before. All those that, would, uh, that Christ died for, that would die to themselves, that would now live for Christ, uh, that would become new creations, that would see the world differently, um, and who he now has given us, every one of us, this ministry, this ministry of reconciliation, okay, that is all, that is all that Christ died for, and that's all that had imputed that. And so, we may ask ourselves, what about all the sins we commit after a Christian? Well, you know, they were all future, they've all happened after Christ died anyway, they, they were all paid for also, I just want to end up with um, with a kind of an idea that, that Paul gives us in Philippians three nine. He he understood this well and gives it to it very well, and he explains to the Philippian church in, in his chapter three verses nine. Uh, he says, "Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish." in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, that comes from doing good deeds, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, the righteousness from God. So we cannot get the righteousness of God confused with any righteousness that we might have as human beings because they are on two different levels. And the only way we can stand before God is by God doing this for us, by God imputing our sins to Christ, giving his perfect righteousness to us that would make us stand before a holy God, blameless and perfect. So that's an awesome thing. That is truly the good news. Good news. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, again, we thank you so much for um, your word. We thank you that... Um, especially for this good news. This is something that we understand by reading your word that we could never be righteous enough to please you. The Lord, your righteousness exceeds anything that is possible from our human standpoint. But we also know this, that you're a loving God and that you love us so much. And in your just works, you paid that price that we could not pay. Uh, we, you sent your son, you, uh, who bore our sins and gave us your righteousness to stand before you. And we praise you so much because we know it's all from you. In your son's name, amen.